We're going to be reflecting on a couple of passages of Scripture together today. Um, the first, we've already read uh, the, the passage from 1 John chapter 3 that we shared earlier this morning. We're also going to be reading a passage from Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. It's maybe a familiar story, but it's always one that's worth uh, revisiting. You can find it on page 749 of your Pew Bible, or you can follow along on the screen. Let's listen to God's word together. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem, and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, he replied, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going far further, but they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. He disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Please pray with me. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this story, Lord, that, that comes from that evening after your son was resurrected. We thank you, Lord, for those whom he encountered who saw fit to pass on these stories, to write them down, and to share them with everyone and anyone who would listen, so that now, 2,000 years later, we might, we might know the risen Christ through the scriptures, through these accounts. We pray, God, that as we think about what the resurrection means in our lives, as we think about what it means that we follow a risen Savior and how that shapes us, we pray that you would give us eyes to see you and ears to hear you, and as... In our story, you would give us hearts that burn within us as we encounter your word. It's in the name of your son, Jesus, that we pray these things. Amen. A few weeks ago, I took Micaiah and Ella uh, over to Irwin Cinemas to check out the, the new version of Cinderella that was playing there. And like a lot of you, over the course of my life, I've seen and read and heard a number of different versions of the Cinderella story. From the animated Disney version I saw as a young child to the version that I read out of a big, dusty book of fairy tales, to other adaptations that have popped up on TV from time to time. And one of the things that I like most about the version that we saw recently is, is the way that it handles the question of identity. About midway through the film, Cinderella meets the prince for the first time out in the woods. She has run away from her cruel stepmother. And he is out with some friends on a stag hunt 
And so they encounter one another in a clearing, and they have their first conversation. Yet as they talk, the, the prince wants to hide who he really is. He tells Cinderella that he works as an apprentice at the palace, learning his father's trade. So naturally, Cinderella assumes that he's some kind of servant to the king. For her part, Cinderella doesn't let on that she's an orphan, forced into virtual slavery by her stepmother and stepsisters. Despite the fact that they obviously like one another, or maybe because of that fact, they keep these vital pieces of information a secret from one another. Later on in the movie, after the ball and the pumpkin and the glass slippers and all the rest, when, uh, spoiler alert, Cinderella and the, and the prince are reunited, all of this pretense has been stripped away. There's no longer any possibility of hiding their respective identities, nor is there any reason to. And so Cinderella makes the prince promise that he will love her as she really is, just a common girl. He, of course, agrees. And as we all know, they live happily ever after. But Cinderella isn't the first story to, to treat these kinds of questions as a central plot point, nor will it be the last. The notion of identity, whether we're talking about crises of identity, or mistaken identity, or secret identity, this has a, a long and rich history in the stories we tell, from Shakespeare's comedies to the Batman movies to the latest CIA thriller. We're fascinated by the question of who we really are and whether or not people can really get to know us. We're terrified by the possibility that someone might steal our identity, as computer geniuses and small-time criminals alike invest an enormous amount of time and energy into doing just that. Like the prince and Cinderella in the forest, we can go to great pains to try to limit how much we let people know about ourselves, how much we let people in. The technologies that we use, and especially social media, can, can aid and abet these practices. Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook, recently said, think about what people are doing on Facebook today. They're keeping up with their friends and family, but they're also building an image and identity for themselves, which in a sense is their brand. They're connecting with the audience that they want to connect to. It's almost a disadvantage if you're not on it now. So identity, what, what we might say is one of the most essential and basic elements of our lives, can be reduced to the level of a brand so that we can carefully cultivate, we can sell a, an image of ourselves to anyone who might be looking. Well, the Bible, of course, is supremely concerned about questions of identity because God's Word is concerned with all of the biggest questions we face. From the very beginning, when we are told that we are created in God's image, through to the end of the New Testament, when we're told that we will be given a new name, which is known only to our Heavenly Father, God is continually seeking to define our identities. He's continually seeking to remind us of who we are and whose we are. And often in the face of opposing viewpoints, opposing voices that, that come at us from a million different directions. The two passages that we read from today, one from Luke's Gospel and, and the other from the first epistle of John, both have something to say about identity. Each in its own way invites us to reflect on who we are and how our identity points to the one who shaped us, the one who formed us, the one who gave us that identity in the first place. The Gospel story, which is taken from Luke's account of the period following the resurrection of Jesus, is sort of a story of mistaken identity. And when we read the stories that unfolded just after Jesus rose from the grave, we find that it isn't uncommon, even for those closest to Jesus, to be confused about who he was, and certainly to be confused about what he was doing out of the tomb. Mary Magdalene, immediately following his resurrection, thinks that he's a gardener, the eleven disciples think that he's a ghost. And the two travelers on the way to Emmaus, Cleopas and his friend, mistake Jesus for a stranger, new to town, ignorant of all the monumental events that have transpired there over the past few days. When Jesus appears beside them along the road, he can tell that they're troubled. And so he asks what they were talking about. 
As they unpack for this newcomer the, the narrative about Jesus, it becomes clear to the reader, and it becomes clear to Jesus as well, that they didn't quite understand who Jesus was. They didn't quite grasp the true nature of his identity as well as they might have thought. You might have noticed they describe him in terms of his power and his accomplishments. They say that he was a prophet. They talk about how powerful he was in word and deed before God and all of the people. And of course, this is true. Jesus was powerful. Jesus was prophetic, both in his words and his actions. These things certainly did point to Jesus' life and work among the people of Israel and among his closest disciples. But as we know, these things aren't the whole story. Cleopas and his friend go on to relate some of the questions and the doubts that emerged when, when Jesus was given over to death by the chief priests and teachers of the law. And I think that maybe the most significant statement they make about Jesus, the one that reveals just how understandably misguided they are in their assessments of who Christ was, comes when they say, we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Even the reports coming from the women, the reports about the empty tomb and a missing body, have done little to overcome the profound feeling of dashed hopes and the trampled visions of a glorious future that these followers of Jesus had, had shared. If they thought they knew who Jesus was, if they thought that the powerful displays of, of divine authority they had witnessed and the the, the proclamations of holy wisdom they had heard defined this man in whom they had placed so much trust. Well, now they weren't so sure. And yet, even as Jesus walks beside them, even as he chastises them for their lack of understanding of God's plan, even as he begins to unpack the scriptural story of how God was working to achieve his purposes in the world, the two travelers to Emmaus are in a kind of fog. Maybe they're in a hurry to get to their destination, and so that prevents them from being focused on what is right in front of them. Maybe they're still wrestling with grief, and that prevents them from embracing the awesome truth standing before them. Whatever the reason, they fail to recognize that the one walking with them, the one talking to them, the one attempting to reveal to them all that God has done and all that God is doing is Jesus himself. Years later, when, when John wrote his first epistle to the church, it was clear to him that these believers he cared so much about were similarly struggling with questions of who they were and of who they were meant to be, of what it all meant. Like the travelers in Luke's gospel, the, the church at the end of the first century to which John was writing was a church that was on a journey of sorts. They were walking a road that was marked with confusing signposts. It was beset on all sides by uncertainty and hostility. For a lot of these Christians, living in a world where the strength of Rome dominated the political and cultural landscape, where the empire, with its pagan gods, its excessive debaucheries, its rhetoric of violence, managed to blot out anything and everything that it saw as a threat. For these Christians, the struggle for truth, the struggle for security, the struggle for identity was a real one. Just a few years earlier, the armies of Caesar had thwarted an uprising by the Jews in Jerusalem. They had destroyed the temple. They had scattered the, the descendants of Abraham to the four winds. On a regular basis, the, the emperor and his governing officials were enacting systematic persecutions against the followers of Jesus everywhere they were found. And so it's not hard to imagine Christians at the end of the first century gathering in their secret places of worship and quietly lamenting in the words of Cleopas, we had hoped that things would be different. We had hoped that Jesus would be the one to redeem God's people. And yet for a people scanning the horizon for some sign of victory, trying to read the signs of the times, trying to, to discern some way beyond a lifetime of, of being on the bottom of the heap. No answers were forthcoming. Just like Cleopas and his friend, the church to which John is writing is having some difficulty recognizing that in the midst of their sadness, in the midst of their confusion, in the midst of their struggles, 
Jesus is right there beside them. They're having difficulty recognizing the Jesus whose spirit is at work in them. Because of their trials, because of their temptations, because of the stories that the world is telling about them, it's becoming more and more difficult for the church to rely on God's promises. This is a situation that is probably at least a little bit familiar to some of us. We may not live under the oppressive thumb of a gigantic empire like Rome, but we can easily get caught up in the concerns and the values of the kingdoms of this world so that we give them authority and rulership over our lives. So that it requires daily acts of resistance to avoid selling out our convictions as followers of Jesus. We may not see pagan temples on every corner, but the marketplace offers a whole variety of false gods and other objects of worship that vie for our attention. Maybe most pervasive are the voices that want to tell us who we are. The voices that want to define our identity. Commercials that tell us that we're just consumers who deserve to buy everything we want. Movies, books, other media that tell us we have to be popular or successful or attractive to the opposite sex or we're not worth much of anything. If we hear these stories often enough, they can begin to transform our understanding of who we are. They can begin to transform our, our perspective on our identity and, and misshape our vision on our place in this world. And so into this troubling situation, both 2,000 years ago but also today, John speaks a word of encouragement. John speaks a word of hope. He speaks a word of affirmation, which is meant to remind the church who they are and whose they are. Continue in him, John says, spurring the church on to greater faithfulness, even in the midst of persecution. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us, he proclaims, to a church that, that would undoubtedly confess to feeling hated and despised and abandoned at times. And the reason that John can make these proclamations and promises to the struggling church is because he is confident of their identity in Christ. The words that John uses to describe the church here are not words of defeat. They are not words of disillusionment. He calls them to be confident. He calls them to be unashamed at the coming of Christ. Most importantly, he reminds them that they are children of God. Everyone who does what is right is born of him, he says in chapter 2, verse 29. Then in 3.1, he rejoices over the love of God that is lavished on us in Jesus Christ, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are, he says. So the questions of identity that the church struggled with, John answers those questions with a straightforward and, and powerful answer. You are God's child. You are made in God's image. You are touched by God's love. Even more than that, you are growing more and more into the likeness of God's Son, Jesus Christ. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. There's an old story about an encounter between the painter Pablo Picasso and the writer Gertrude Stein. Early in the 20th century, Picasso asked Stein to, to sit for him so that he could paint her portrait. She agreed, and, and Picasso applied his inventive genius to the task of depicting his subject. Apparently, a mutual friend saw the portrait that Picasso was painting, and he remarked, Gertrude doesn't look like that. Picasso answered, that doesn't make any difference. She will. From where we stand currently, as imperfect followers of a perfect Savior, the, the notion that we might resemble our Lord is unlikely at best. Maybe it's even laughable. We see our sin. We, we look at ourselves and we see our weakness. We see our inability even to keep it all together, let alone to exemplify the character of our God. But when God looks at us, when, when he applies his capacity for transformation to our lives, he's able to purify us. He's able to, to sanctify us, to, to make us holy so that there is less of us and more of Christ in our every thought, our every action, our every word. We might say, we don't, we don't look like Jesus. And God says, that doesn't matter. You will. 
And while this vision is something that, that might be fulfilled in the, in the life of the world to come when, when God makes all things new, it's, it's still a vision that's very much rooted in our relationship to Jesus in this life. By walking with him and by walking like him, we point forward to God's purposes being fulfilled. In the story of the road to Emmaus, after the two travelers have walked beside Jesus, after they've shared with him what's on their hearts, even after they've, they've listened to him unpack the, the scriptural prophecies and narratives that pointed to his death and resurrection, Cleopas and his friends still don't recognize who it is they're sharing the road with. But they do know that they aren't ready to let him go. And so when Jesus starts to continue on without, him, without them, they, they urge him to stay where they are staying, and Jesus agrees. It's during this visit that their eyes are open, but, but maybe not in the way we would expect. We read that as they sat at the table, as they were about to share a meal, Jesus took bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it. And in that moment, they experienced the recognition that had eluded them. Now, there are a number of theories that have been put forth as, as to exactly why it became clear to them that this was Jesus. Some, some have speculated that the act of breaking the bread, holding out the jagged crust, as Jesus had done just three nights earlier in that upper room, revealed that this was the Lord. Others have argued that when Jesus held out the bread, the, his, his fellow travelers actually saw the scars in Jesus' hands when he offered it to them. Maybe it was simply that in the quiet of the pre-dinner moment, when they stopped talking for a few seconds, they were able to hear the voice of the Spirit speaking the truth to them about who it was sitting across the table. Regardless, the important thing to note is that Jesus' identity was revealed to them, not in some grandiose display of power, but in a quiet moment of service, as he offered a piece of bread to a couple of hungry travelers. It's the same with us. John states that the world does not know us. That is, the world doesn't understand our identity as God's children because it doesn't know him. See, the world is looking for some version of Jesus that will satisfy their curiosity, that will meet all their desires, that will dazzle them with an outsized exhibition of power. And so just as when Jesus first came into this world, the world so often misses out on what God is doing. We can sometimes fall into the trap of, of wanting to convince those around us of our power, our strength, our importance. And we don't realize that it will only be in those moments when we are most vulnerable rather than holding on to our pride. When we're giving rather than receiving. When we're serving rather than seeking to be served. That will be most like Jesus. It's in those moments that people will see Jesus in us. And in those moments, all of the questions about our identity will be answered in the lives we live. We are servants of the King. We are apprentices of our Lord. We are children of the Most High God. Please pray. God, we thank you for stories like the ones we just read, the one we just read about the road to Emmaus. We thank you for servants of the church like Luke and John who share these stories with us. Because, God, we know that we have a lot of questions about who we are as individuals, as a church. And, Lord, there's no better way to answer these questions or to find answer these, to, to these questions than to turn to your word, to turn to your good news, and see that who we are is, is your children, created to be like your son, Jesus. We pray, God, that, that as we wrestle in this world with your scriptures, with our calling, with our identity, that you would reveal to us more and more that we are yours and that we might be able to share that with others, not by overpowering them, not by browbeating them, but, but simply by speaking truth and love to those around us. So God, we pray that we would have hearts that would receive you that you would transform our lives, that we might be more and more like your son. It's in your son's name we pray these things. Amen.